Good evening to you and welcome. My name is Tina Martin. I am the host of GBH World Channel's Local USA series. I'm also a professor of journalism at Boston University. Thank you so much for joining us for our 11th edition of our monthly Beyond the Page book club. Today, I am so excited because I will be joined by Marjan Kamali. She's the author of The Stationery Shop, a Publishers Weekly and Boston Globe bestseller, and one of NPR's best books of the year. Special recognition to Trident Booksellers and Cafe, who partnered with Beyond the Page Book Club on this event. Trident is open for curbside pickup and limited capacity in-store browsing. You can visit them in-store from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week or on their website, which is 24-7. So before we get started, I want to explain how this is going to work. You are not going to be able to see yourself on video and you're not going to be able to speak to our author today during the interview. But what you will be able to do is ask questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. You can type in your question. And if you put your questions in at any point in time during the interview, uh, during our hour, Marjan is going to address them. And I promise that we will try to get to as many questions as you uh, would like. And you don't need to wait to do that to the second half of the event. You can actually start putting your questions in now. So you can certainly do that. Um, if you see a question that you want us to answer, vote, by, uh, vote, vote for it by clicking the thumbs up to move it to the top of the list. And we're definitely going to do our very best to answer the most popular questions. Okay, here's some housekeeping. Zoom has recently rolled out an automated captioning feature and we're excited to now be able to offer this so that everyone can enjoy our events. So to turn on the closed captioning feature, you click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two screens two transcript display options are going to pop up. We recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript and that's a sidebar window that's going to open up where you can see where what each speaker is saying. So, but please keep in mind that closed captioning may be slightly delayed. Lastly, we'll be asking a couple of poll questions tonight. We're gonna to start right now. Um, in the center of your screen, you should see a question that says, is this your first time at a Beyond the Page event? You can close this um, by clicking on it and or hitting it. So um, I'll give you just a moment to answer that and then we'll have a, a gauge of who is our for one of our first time visitors here. Okay, all right, so more than half of you, this is your first time joining us. So we are so excited to have you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So let's get started. It is my pleasure to now introduce Marjan Kamali. Marjan is the author of The Stationery Shop, a Publishers Weekly and Boston Globe bestseller. She is one of NPR's best books of the year. And Together T is another book that was selected as a Massachusetts Book Award finalist. Her novels have been translated into dozens of languages and her debut was adapted for the stage. Marjan was born in Turkey to Iranian parents and she has been all over the world. She spent her childhood in Germany, Kenya, Iran, and of course the United States. She graduated from UC Berkeley and has an MBA from Columbia University and an MFA from NYU. Marjan currently lives with her husband and two children in the Boston area and she teaches creative writing at Grub Street. Marjan, welcome, 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 welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tina, for having me. It's such a thrill to be here tonight for the GBH Book Club. It is an absolute pleasure. And now I understand that you actually want to read a passage from the book. Yes, I thought we'd start off the evening with me reading just a short passage from the book. And when I was thinking about what to read for all of you, I thought, why not read from the very beginning? Because that way I don't need to describe anything. It's just as though you were picking up the book for the first time. So chapter one, 2013, The Center. I made an appointment to see him. She said it as if she were seeing the dentist or a therapist or the pushy refrigerator salesman who had promised her and Walter a lifetime guarantee of cold milk and crisp vegetables and unspoiled cheese if only they would buy this brand new model. Walter dried the dishes, his gaze on the kitchen towel and its print of a yellow chick holding an umbrella. He didn't argue. 
Walter Archer's penchant for logic, his ability to let reason trump all was a testament to Roya's own good judgment. For hadn't she married a man who was reasonable and my goodness, unbelievably understanding. Hadn't she in the end not married that boy, the one she had met so many decades ago in a small stationery shop in Tehran, but lassoed her life instead to this Massachusetts born pillar of stability. This Walter, who ate a hard boiled egg for breakfast almost every single day, who said as he dried the dishes, if you want to see him, then you should. You've been a bit of a wreck, I'm afraid. By now, Roya Archer was almost American, not just by marriage, but by virtue of having been in these United States for over five decades. She could remember a childhood spent in the hot and dusty streets of Tehran, playing tag with her little sister, Zari, but her life now was carefully enclosed in New England with Walter. One visit to one shop a mere week ago to buy paper clips had cracked everything open. Once again, she was mired in 1953, cinema metropole in the middle of Iran's largest city that contentious summer. The red circular sofa in the lobby over which a chandelier's crystals, gu crystals glistened like tears, smoke from cigarettes floated in wisps up the stairs and into the movie theater he had led her, and there on the screen, stars with foreign names caressed each other. After the film, he had walked with her in the summer twilight. The sky was lavender and layered with shades of purple so varied they seemed impossible. He had asked her to marry him near the jasmine silk bushes. His voice cracked when he said her name. They had exchanged countless love letters, planned their union, but in the end, nothing. Life had pulled out from under her everything that they had planned. No worries. Roya's mother had always said that our fate is written on our foreheads when we're born. It can't be seen, can't be read, but it's there in invisible ink all right, and life follows that fate no matter what. She had squished that boy out of her mind for decades. She had a life to build, a country to get to know. Walter, a child to raise. That Tehran boy could very well be squeezed to the absolute bottom of the bucket like a rag useless and worn out and pressed so far down into the depths that after a while he was almost forgotten. But now she could finally ask him why he had left her there in the middle of the square. And I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, thank you very much. Now this is actually, it's time for our second poll question. And so our, our question to uh, those who are joining us is, uh, did you finish the stationery shop? Did you finish the book? And let's see, let's see what our answers are. This is a very important question because of the ensuing conversation that we are going to have. Okay, so 94% of the folks who are on here have finished the book. Um, and so we have a, a smaller percent of folks who are still uh, reading. We're saying that because there may or may not be some spoiler alerts this evening in our conversation. So just be aware of that. Um, as we move forward here. Uh, we're starting, uh, there's so much Q&A here, so I'm going to, um, let's uh, have some conversation and then we will, I, I promise that we will try to get to as many of these questions as possible. Um, but uh, Majan, we were talking before uh, we started here, just kind of in a, um, you know, a warming up session um, about the inspiration for your characters and um, the inspiration for Aurora and the inspiration for Balmain. So can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, you know, I get asked a lot whether Roya and Bahman are based on real people and um, I'll just get it out of the way. I did make them up, they're fictional, 
but the book was inspired by a person I met after I visited book clubs for my first book for Together Tea. And a woman had asked me to visit where she worked. She said she worked in an assisted living center. So I drove down to Duxbury, Massachusetts to the Duxbury Senior Center. And I did a reading from my book there. And as I was reading um, this elderly gentleman in a wheelchair, he kept saying these things. And at first I wasn't sure if he was heckling me or cheering me on, but he kept saying all these things. And later they'd organized this lovely Persian lunch because there's a lot of food in both books. And he wheeled himself up to me and he kept saying things like, I met the Prince of Spain, I travel with Charles de Gaulle and these outlandish things and people were shushing him. But I asked him his name. And later when I was chatting with my own dad, I mentioned this gentleman because he had an Iranian name and my dad thinks he knows every Iranian American of a certain generation or might know. And when I mentioned the name, my father said, oh, he was one of our most decorated dignitaries. He met the Prince of Spain. He traveled with Charles de Gaulle. Everything that man had said was true. So I was very much struck by that image of a person in an assisted living center with this past that people either don't believe or they believe, but they don't really care. And that was the kernel that started the book. And what about Roya? Roya is made up, but you know, anytime you're writing a fictional character, the emotional truths are often borrowed from real life. There are composites in the person uh, of people that you do know. Roya for me represents so many Iranian women I know of that age who were children in the 50s adolescence in the 60s and then spent their adulthood, you know, through the revolution of 79 and, and uh, later. So she is made up, but of course there's an emotional core that's from real life. And so we talked about, um, you know, the book being um, centered in, in the 1950s and uh, you had mentioned research, right? And much of that research um, included talking to your family members, some of whom were not really uh, excited to talk with you. Yes, yeah, so for the research for the book, because I had to educate myself about 1953, about the coup d'etat, I did what any author would do, which is, you know, read books about that time period. There are so many great accounts now that break down that day literally by the minute, you know, what happened on August 19th, 1953. But I was also in a position of privilege, as you said, where I had access to these elders in my family. And some of the people I contacted didn't want to talk to me because they didn't necessarily want me to write a book about Iran. It felt to them something that others may not be interested in. Um, maybe they didn't want to revisit the coup. Uh, it was a traumatic experience for a lot of people who lived through it. But those who did speak to me helped me immensely. And the person who helped me the most was my own father, because he shared with me so much about that time period. And so you talk about, um, you know, some some elders in your family saying, you know, uh, we're not sure people would be interested in this. Um, did you have those thoughts when it, you know, when you started to do the research for this book and you decided this is what I'm going to do? Um, was your mindset, you know what, it doesn't matter if one person reads it or 500,000 people? Yes, I did have those thoughts. There was part of me that was really worried because um, how could I not internalize some of those voices. And I kept thinking, do people really want to read about Iran? Do they want to read about teenagers in 1953 in Iran? Um, and the first draft was more set in New England in the present day. But the people who read my first draft, including my agent said, oh, please, can we just have more of Iran? And um, it was hard for me to accept that people were interested, but it got to the point, Tina, when I was writing this book that I was in too deep. And I basically was at this stage where I thought, you know, it doesn't matter if not one person reads this book, I need to make it what I want it to be. And I need to be true to these characters. So that ended up taking over the other doubts. 
And now the book has been tremendously successful. And so what is it like being on the other side of that now? It's incredibly rewarding. It's gratifying. Um, I won't lie, it still surprises me when I get messages from people. I get messages on Instagram, email, almost daily from all over the world. And part of me still thinks, how do you know about these characters? Because they were mine and they were in my laptop. But of course, it's been almost two years now. I've come to terms with the fact that the book is out there and uh, these characters belong to people who are reading it as much as they do to me, if not more so. So it's really rewarding. It gives me a sense of deep connection that came from something I did in such isolation. And so you talked about your characters. Um, you are actually in a room where you did much of your writing. And so you have uh, your notebooks. Can you show us what that looks like? So I, one of the benefits of Zoom is that I am literally sitting at the desk where I wrote the book. So this very desk, this lovely piece of wood here. And um, I wanted to share with you some of my notebooks because sometimes people think there's some grand process to this thing. It boils down to paper and pen. So this is the notebook for each book. I have a notebook. This is the notebook for the stationery shop. And it's, it's uh, you know, one of those like three part notebooks. And in the beginning, I have all my notes, like my research notes where I educated myself. And um, actually this is a map. I don't know if you can see, this is a map of old Tehran that my father drew because he was very, um, keen that I get the geography correct. So I just want everybody to know every street name, every square is geographically accurate. And the Simon & Schuster copy editors then checked it too. So that is uh, something I never thought I'd have to do for fiction, but you do have to get those things right. And then this section is where I just made notes of scenes that I wanted to write by hand because I wrote much of the first draft by hand, some of the most difficult scenes by hand. And so when did you go from writing, um, writing everything out to switching it to digital? I did it in tandem. So as I was doing the first draft, I needed to have a sense of where I was in the big picture in the document. So I took the handwritten notes and regularly transcribe them. But I do think for some of the more emotional scenes, and we know that this is an emotional book, um, sounds like a lot of people did read it. So that's, I'm not giving anything away by saying that, but um, I needed to write them by hand. And in fact, you know, for some of the scenes that had me sobbing, I had to use this notebook so that, yeah, I had a special one for <laughs> heartstrings notebook. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like, don't touch it, it'll burn you. Put that over there, yeah. All right, let me uh, just reintroduce ourselves here. If you're just joining us, welcome. We are continuing our conversation with award-winning author Marjan Kamali, and we welcome you. As a reminder, if you have questions, and I see so many questions here, so we are going to try our best to get to all these questions, use the Q&A tab that's located at the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we promise we will do our very, very best to get to uh, those questions. I'm actually, uh, let me just take a few of them. Um, Marjan, I, I uh, Look, due to having to uh, be on my laptop so much, I now wear glasses. So I'm going to use my glasses. <laughs> yeah, I, did you wear glasses before? I before? No, I didn't have to wear them the way I do now. No. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. All right, let's see here. All right. So um, Donna uh, asked the question. She says, how much of the story was from your own life? Um. Honestly, with this one, not much. Together T, what like most first novels, um, has much more of my own life in it. It's semi-autobiographical. But with this one, it was a pleasure to go back to a time and place. I, you know, most of the events happened before I was born. So um, not much. Okay. And Amy says, based on your discussions with your native Iranian friends and family, what is their opinion of Iran now? 
um, let's not, let's, let's skip that one. Let's see. Uh, let me see, what else can we get here? We have so many. Oh, okay. How did Bahman get to the US? Yeah, I do get asked that question often in book club visits. And um, I, I think I should have put a sentence in the book that explained it because I get asked that a lot. Um, Roya and Bahman had their mutual friend, Jahangir, and they, uh, that was the way they kept in touch, right? That's how they kept hearing news from one another through him. Bahman, we know from his letters, was in Iran through much of the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s. And then he came to the US with his family um, in the mid 80s to New England. Excellent. Okay, so Carol actually has a question that I had and we, we discussed this already. How did you come to writing? And then I will add to that, when did you know you wanted to be a book author? Yeah, so when I was little, I always read, I loved to read from the minute I could read, I would read books. And I was, you know, what we would call a bookworm back then. And I knew I wanted to be a writer deep in my soul when I was a child, but it just didn't seem like a viable option for me. And I think like most first generation immigrants, it was, um, a, you know, a professional path like becoming a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer was a much more suited path than becoming an artist. Uh, so it really wasn't until I was in college that I considered it seriously. Okay, um, let's see. We have Lynn here who says, um, I would like to know how you saw Walter's role in the book. Yes, Walter. I did not think of Walter as a compromise for Roya. Um, I know much of the book, we're pursuing Roya's sense of unfinished business with her first love. She has this need for closure and she is able to sort of freeze her first love in a certain time and place because they didn't end up together. But Walter is also her love. And in my opinion, which at this point is no more valid than any of yours, but in my opinion, she loves Walter deeply and he loves her. And I think it's possible to love in your life more than one person in that way. It's just different. And Janet has a good question. How long did it take you to write the book? Did you start, uh, did you work start to finish beginning to end? I do try to write my first drafts um, as they would perhaps appear in the book. Though of course, in revision, the structure changes. It took me two and a half years to write the first draft. And then it took me an additional year to revise it. So three and a half years total. Wow, okay. Amy says she loved that the book alternated between the past and the present day. Did you do that uh, expressly to up the suspense? I did that very intentionally, yes. Uh, to up the suspense and to also hopefully touch upon the theme that time isn't linear. Um, when the book begins, Roy is 77, but the minute she sees Batman, she's also 17. And I wanted to explore that idea that at any given time, we're all the ages we've ever been. All right. Um, okay. So we're talking about, uh, there's a lots of food in the book. Yeah. And so uh, Julia says, of course, she loved the book. Of course you do, Julia. Thanks for attending. Um, and the food was such a thread throughout it. Um, she's saying that she hopes that you're going to do a cookbook or recipe blog. Is that something you're interested in? I think I should be because I get asked about a cookbook a lot. There's so many good uh, Persian cookbooks out there, so many good food blogs that I feel I... It's not my expertise, but I do love to cook. And I have a mom who cooks so well. I learned a lot from her. Maybe one day, maybe, who knows. And so what is your favorite thing to cook? I, I love to cook too, so. I like to cook all kinds of cuisines, but my absolute favorite thing to cook is actually um, Persian cuisines. And I like to cook the, the dishes that are quite 
time consuming because I feel it gives me a huge sense of satisfaction. So much goes into it and there are all these layers and then you get this beautiful result. So um, I'm a big fan of a dish. It's the dish that Walter proposes to Roya over while they're eating it or my sapsi, my absolute fave. Excellent. Okay, Karen asks, the station, the stationery shop in Newtonville, is that a real place and what's its name? It is not a real place. I made it up. And after the book came out, I found out there is a stationery shop in Newton called the Paper Mouse. But this one was entirely fictional in my mind. Excellent. Okay, Stacy says she loved the book and couldn't put it down. Of course you did, Stacy. We all did. All right. Um, would you ever entertain a sequel detailing how Roya's life progresses? Also, Zari's. We'll stop there and let you answer that. And then there's another part to the question. Um, not right now. I'm not entertaining a sequel, but maybe one day because I would like for Claire and Kyle to get together. Okay. And Andrea wants to know why was Walter so patient and understanding? Because he's Walter. He, you know, there are very few people like him, I, I agree, but I do think that part of the reason he was so patient and understanding was because he's 77 in those scenes. Enough of life has gone by. They've gone through so much loss together. And maybe Walter at 37 wouldn't have been as understanding, but at 77, I think he's got a certain perspective and he just wants Roya to have the gift of closure and healing. And uh, Julia is uh, excited about your cover designer. Oh. Uh, how much, how much, uh, you know, how much work was that for you? I was the beneficiary of her wonderful design. Um, you know, the original cover for the stationery shop was different, but they went back to the drawing board. Um, they decided to make it more in tune with the tone of the book. And then we got this gorgeous cover. So I'm just very grateful. I really had nothing to do with it. I can't take credit for it. And so were there more than one design that was presented to you? Initially, there was a different design, supremely different. Um, and I being polite said, oh, it's nice, yay. But um, other people stepped in, the sales department, my agent stepped in and said, you know what? Maybe we need to go back to the drawing board. And they did. And then look at this, it's amazing. It's very beautiful. All right, now it's time to take a break and hear from Sandy Chin um, about how you can continue to support GBH's efforts, not only beyond the page, but all the virtual events that we continue to, to provide. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Tina, how are you? Good. Good. All right, I think I'm about to come on and join you guys. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for spending some time with us during tonight's Beyond the Page event. There's always something so special about a community of people brought together by a book. And if you enjoy Beyond the Page events like this one, please consider making a sustaining gift to GBH. Sustainers serve as a steady and reliable source of support for GBH, allowing us to keep the news and all the programs you love on air and online. And it's a great way to spread your support throughout the year as you tune into or listen to GBH programs all year long. And with a gift of $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member, or $60 all at once, you can choose from two different thank you gifts. Receive a hard copy of April's Beyond the Page Pick, The Burning Girls by CJ Tudor, or an autographed copy of Mahjan Kamali's first book, Together Tea, another beautiful cover there. And with these two wonderful choices, there are two easy and safe ways to give. You can go to gbh.org slash support events or text GBH to 800 492-1111 to make a donation of $50 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once, whatever works for you. And we'll send you your book of choice. And even easier, go ahead and click on that link that you see in the chat to head to gbh.org slash support events and contribute what you can. And to those who are already supporting members, we thank you. And back to you, Tina, with more of Beyond the Page. 
Thank you so much, Sandy. It's time to continue our discussion with Marjan Kamali. And we are going to continue to answer your questions and there are many. Okay, um, I like this question from Amy. Do you know the whole plot or scope of the book in the beginning or does it come to you? Oh gosh, no, I do not know it. How I wish I did, but I struggle through the draft to figure out what the plot is and it reveals itself as I write but I don't know it when I start. Okay. And Sarah says, of course, the book was wonderful. Um, she struggled with uh, some history, historical context. Did you struggle with uh, what to include as it relates to Iran? Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a big decision you have to make when you write books that are based around a historical event. In the end, I made my decisions based on how the characters would be reacting versus you know just including more history so i let the history be more of a background and the characters in their story the foreground but it it involved a lot of choices i had to make of what to leave in and what to leave out and now have you ever visited or lived in iran i did live in iran between the ages of two and five and again between nine and almost 11. i visited when I wasn't there, um, I didn't visit for a long time, but then I visited in my 20s a few times and in my 30s a few times. Okay, and what was the difference in those the visits as you got older? Well, you know, the country underwent so much change after the 79 revolution. That was the revolution of my childhood. So every time I went back, it felt slightly different and yet the same. Uh, politics can do a lot of damage and it can create a lot of division and create change, but the core culture stays the same. So that was, that was great. And to have the, the beauty of, you know, the country stay was a relief. So, yeah. Excellent. All right. Deirdre, can you talk about the role of individuals who facilitate communication between the characters, how they do it and why? So maybe Deirdre is talking about characters like Jahangir, who facilitates. Um, you, you have to have, when you're doing a book set in 1953 and there's no texting and no you know, easy phone calls across oceans, you do have to have some characters who serve as the mutuals. So they had their mutual good friend Jahangir and he kind of served as that. I don't know if that's answering Deirdre's question, but. If not, Deirdre certainly put another question in the Q&A and we will we'll try to get to it. Um, Jane says, how do you approach writing? Do you have a daily schedule? That's a good question. Um, or uh, do you wait for the uh, elusive muse? So neither one. I think waiting for the elusive muse is a recipe for things not happening because the muse is pretty stingy, especially in the beginning. She doesn't like to come and sit on your shoulder. So I've learned not to wait for the muse. However, daily writing is also, if you set that as your goal, it can be a recipe for failure because what ends up happening is you say, okay, I have to write every day. And then you don't. And then you say, well, then maybe I'm not meant to do this and it can make you feel as though you failed, but it's okay to not write every day. Most people can't write every day. So I try to set a schedule, but I'm very forgiving of myself, almost too forgiving perhaps, but I always look at it as the long game. And I always think it's okay if you didn't do it today. It's okay if you only did a little bit this week because you're always writing your novel, even when you're not actually writing it. There's a lot of gestating that goes on. Um, we have someone who didn't give us their name, but Bauman's um, mother held control over his part, his life partner choice. Was this a reflection on her past relationship with the stationery shop owner? I think it was. I think that relationship and the trauma that it caused her and the sense of loss that it caused her, the humiliation really, because he wasn't willing to leave his 
status or his class to be with a melon seller's daughter, you know, I think it really affected her. And she was so young and it created, I don't want to give too many spoilers, but it, we know it created some deep, deep losses for her. So she was shaped by that and it affected how she approached her one surviving child. And this was actually a question that I asked you and I was, you know, I was really excited about your answer, but Amy wants to know, um, who are some of your favorite authors and books? And I'm going to add, and why? Ooh, um, well, two of my all time favorite authors are Toni Morrison and Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye changed the way I thought about writing, literally. I read it when I was a teenager and it blew my mind because I suddenly had access to this new way of using language that you know I thought we weren't allowed to do, but she showed me, you can, you can do that. And um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude kind of did that for me too when I was a teenager. And the why, Tina, is because I don't tire of reading these two authors. I just reread Sula mm -hmm. uh, again mm -hmm. after having read it first 30 years ago. And I would read that book every day for the rest of my life if I, you know, if I could. Of course I can, so maybe I should. But yeah, they're just so powerful. Excellent. All right, let's see here. Um, I think we got this first question. I think we answered Marie's question. Uh, Marilyn says, I love the scene where Patricia finally embraces Roya after the tragedy with Marigold. How did this scene develop? Ooh, that's an interesting scene to discuss. That scene wasn't initially in the first draft of the book that I sent to my editor. And she's the one who uh, reached out to me and said, oh my gosh, Patricia is so darn mean. And we talked about whether it made sense to have her redeem herself. And um, when I listened to my editor, I realized it did make sense. I just had to find the right way of doing it. And then I thought of the whole Persian New Year, first day of spring, Patricia brings those ingredients. That's how that scene came about. Excellent. Uh, and this is always, you know, a question. Um, everyone wants to know what you're working on now. Is that yeah, so guess what? I have a new notebook now. <laughs> <laughs> Time for a new notebook. So here's the third book's notebook. And right now it's a bit of a mess. Uh, but, you know, I've got all my little dividers. And um, it, again, like the first two books, I feel like this is maybe my Iranian trilogy. This third book also takes place in the US and in Iran. This time we go back to the 1960s and it's a story of friendship. So I'm figuring it out. As you go, okay. As you go, yeah. And um, you have lived in so many places um, and we talked about um, advice for uh, aspiring authors. Um, and one of the things you said to me was all your experiences, you know, kind of culminated to this moment, you know, where you are, you know, you know, this successful author. Talk about that a little bit. And then also, um, I know you said, you know, don't do this for the glory. Oh, yes. Please don't do it for the glory. Um, because at the end of the day, even when you get the glory, and I feel as though with the stationery shop, I've been privileged to get the glory, right? The, the recognition that we want and the attention and the reaction from readers. It's not the glory that is your high. The biggest reward is when you're alone with the characters in a room with the door closed, developing their story. And unless that's what you're after, then I don't think you should do it. Because A, the glory doesn't always happen. It's a lot of luck. B, when it happens, it can be fleeting. And C, even when it happens, it's not about that at all. It's about the actual doing of it. So if you don't love the actual process of writing, I don't think you should do it. 
As far as the first part of your question, living in different places, it's certainly not a prerequisite to being a writer. It just gave me a perspective because I lived in so many cultures. And at the end of the day, I realized whether I was in Kenya or Germany or in, or in Iran, people are the same, people are the same and emotional dynamics are the same. And that kind of gave me uh, a sense of confidence to write about the human condition. And you also mentioned being patient if you really want to be an author. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, you know, I see so many young students who think that they need to be published by a certain age. Oh, I have to be published by the time I'm 30. I have to be published by this time. I would say throw away the clock. It doesn't work like that. Even if you plan it and you do your very best, um, and let's say you are published by the time you're 30, then what? You finish one book, you, you usually then write another. So I would say throw away the clock, be in it for the long game. We always hear life is short, but life is long and you need to let your craft develop. And maybe the book that you publish when you're young is not the best book you could have written anyway. So, um, Practice your craft with a sense of nurturing. And it's not a chore, it's a privilege, you know. I, you know, to, to be sitting here at this desk writing, even though I do complain sometimes, this is a privilege, you know, I'm not digging a coal mine. So I think recognize what a gift it is and then do it with care, you know, the way you would nurture anything that you want to grow. You have to give it your attention. It's not gonna write by itself. And patience. Patience, please. Just, if I were to tell you, Tina, that my first book was published in 2013 or 2011, would you care? No. I mean, it makes no difference now, right? But you, the book it would have been in 2011 wouldn't it be it wouldn't have been as good as it was in 2013 so give yourself the time just you're not going to age out of writing that's a good that's a very good uh good way to put it okay we i'm promising i'm trying to get through to all of these questions uh you are well loved Okay. Um, uh, this is, you know, someone who didn't give us her name. Uh, they said, I loved how Roya gradually won over, uh, won others over by sharing her Persian food, thinking of her neighbor in Cal in the California neighborhood. Yes. So that was so intentional in this book. I, in the first book, I had a lot of food and people said, why did you include a lot of food? And I said, did I? Because I didn't know I was doing it. But in this book, it was very intentional. Um, I wanted the food to represent a sense of communication. So when Roya is in Iran, the food connects her to her mother, to her family, the, the entire extended family. When she moves to the US, it connects her to her past, but it also lets her communicate with Walter. So for example, their first date, really it's, a, it's through food that they're communicating because her English isn't even that good yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the preparing of food and sharing of food, um, there's a bonding that happens for these characters. It's all intentional. Food is a great equalizer. Mm-hmm. Still that one. Yeah. Great equalizer. And it's a great way, it's a great like entryway into a culture. Mm -hmm. I love food. Yeah. So don't yeah. get me about food. Okay, so uh, another question. What was your career prior to becoming an, an author? Mm -hmm. I had many different things that I did, like most authors. Um, I worked for a while as a research assistant at a pharmaceutical company. I was an administrative assistant at the Laboratory of Biochemical Genetics and Metabolism at Rockefeller University. I um, taught at Boston University School of Management. I did a lot of things. Um, none of them were, you know, the thing I wanted to do full time the way writing is. But, you know, all of them informed who I am and were helpful. 
Okay, Candace says, I believe I noticed some similarities in the description of the years in Boston with sections of Lahiri's The Namesake. Do you think that that's just a coincidence of first generation immigrant stories plus geography? Probably because though I've read Lahiri's collection of short stories, I haven't read The Namesake. So maybe I should. Um, I think so. I mean, there's going to be overlap in the experience of first generation immigrants. It's inevitable. Okay. Uh, Carol says, how does someone like a melon seller's daughter jump the cast in this culture? Well, it's hard. And especially the, the melon seller's daughter that we see at age 14, a love affair that she has with the stationery shop owner as a young 18 year old, that's in 1916. It would have been very hard to cross class lines. Iran doesn't really have a caste system the way India does, but it has a very strong class system. Later on, she manages to break the system and you know, not stay contained in her class through her marriage to Mr. Aslan, who's from a more educated family, but he's willing to be shunned by his sisters and his relatives. That's what it would have taken back then. It was a lot harder to marry through across class lines. And Pat says, as you were writing, did you have a favorite character? That's a good question. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, you know, my favorite character ended up being Mrs. Aslan, even though she does some of the most damage in the book. Spoiler alert, she um, is a piece of work, but she suffers from a mental illness. And when she started, she was an archetype of this sort of mean mother-in-law type of villain. But as I wrote her and her story developed, I grew to have great empathy for her. And I realized that much of her behavior is not under her control. And that's a hard pill to swallow when we have people in our lives who do things we don't agree with that cause great harm, it's hard to accept that it's not under their control, their behavior. If you have a mental illness, it's not under your control. And for those of us there, I think there's like 10% of us here who hadn't finished reading the book. So there are some spoiler alerts here uh, in my conversation with Marjan Kamali. So just in case you, you know, are, you know, you can, you can uh, cover your ears for a few of these if you, if you feel like you're, you're uh, losing some suspense. Okay, Kathleen says, I traveled to Iran in 1976 and experienced the public's complex anticipation of the revolution. Have you contemplated a novel set in that era? Ooh, not yet, but well, actually the new one I'm, I'm writing, some of it will take place then and in Together Tea, she's a child, but we do go through the 70s. Um, but not in depth. So I think that would be a very interesting time to explore on the edge of the revolution, yeah. And Lynn doesn't have a question. She just wants to make a comment and I am going to allow it. <laughs> um, I could not put this book down. The way you opened the book was so inviting to know more. And I would imagine that was intentional. Yes. So I'm really happy that Lynn agrees because it was. So that worked out, yes. All right. Uh, Janet says, have you ever started a book that you abandoned or might come back to someday? That's a good one. Thanks, Janet. Yes, I started um, a middle grade book several years ago and I really loved it. But then I was in a writing group and some of the comments that my critique partners made took the wind out of my sails. So I put it aside, but well, maybe one day. What was the critique, if you don't mind us asking? Now um, yeah, you know, I think being in writing groups, I'm not in a writing group uh, now. I haven't been for about 10 years. I think it, it works for a lot of people, but sometimes when you show your work too soon to people, whether it's your spouse or your friends or your critique partners, if you show your draft too soon, it's almost like a tender little embryo that isn't ready for feedback yet. Um, and I really mean the draft. I don't mean the author's very fragile ego. Sometimes it's too soon to show. And the, the feedback, even if it's positive, can kind of take the fizz out. So I think what I heard was, 
oh, like the character is too, I don't know, happy to begin with. Maybe the parents have to be divorced, something like that. And it just, it didn't make sense for me to be affected by it, but I was. Okay, all right. Uh, let's see here. Janet says, how do you keep your connection to your Iranian heritage and culture in the present? The biggest way is through food. So um, that is something that is a very viable and enjoyable way for me to connect. Um, obviously, I love to be in touch with my family who is now all over the world, but that helps me too, you know, and um, keeps me speaking Persian and keeps me a little bit like in the whole culture. And I read a lot. I read a lot of books that are about Iran, set in Iran. I try to educate myself. And Sandy wants to know, would you like to see The Stationery Shop as a movie? Yes, Sandy, I would. I really would. And, and so <laughs> I've a step further. So who would you like to play uh, Roya? Is there an, an actress uh, or something you have in mind? You know, it's really hard because we see her for a long time when she's 17. And then we see her when she's 77. And we also see her in between there. Um, I have not narrowed it down, but the good news is there's so many great Iranian American actresses that are in Hollywood right now and doing great work. So it's an embarrassment of riches. Though my dad thinks Meryl Streep should play her, but we'll see. <laughs> okay. we'll see about that okay all right um marge says i loved and was totally surprised by the plot twist that someone rewrote the letters how did that occur to you okay so this is the time for you to not listen if you haven't finished the book yes let's just say that um it was like a puzzle i had to solve and i knew the pieces I just didn't know how it all came together. And I experimented with a lot of ways that series of events could occur. And without giving it all away, I knew I had to have the letters written in such a way that Roya would think Batman doesn't wanna see her and, and vice versa. It had to be powerful enough to keep them apart. So. I thought of you know what that could be okay we have about five minutes left um, marjan so i'm going to try to do my best here all right amy says iranian poetry is a big part of this book are you a fan yourself i am a fan and um um you know i grew up with every adult i know sort of just spontaneously quoting a verse when anything happened it's it's embedded in the culture and when I was in school in Iran for the short time that I was, it was part of our curriculum. Um, so again, I'm trying to educate myself to read it in Persian because it's supposed to be way, way better in Persian. Okay, Kathleen said, would you recommend some novels or nonfiction about Iran? Yes, so the book that I uh, used for my research for this book, if you wanna know about some of the the details of what happened is All the Shah's Men by Stephen Kinzer. That, you know, I'm not saying it's the be all end all, but it gave me a really good grasp of the time period. It's a good nonfiction book. Um, fiction wise, we are blessed to have so many great authors now. Song of a Captive Bird by Jasmine Zarnik explores um, an Iranian poet who's a woman and, and it's a great book, Farouk Farouk Saad, it's her biography. Also, there's a collection called My Shadow is My Skin, um, which is a, like an anthology that includes a lot of different Iranian writers all over the world. And um, Daughter of Smoke and Fire um, explores the Kurdish Iranian experience which has not been written about as much and um, is really interesting and sad. Thank you for the recommendations. Okay, we are, wow, we're running out of time here. That was mm -hmm. such a mm -hmm. great time. Time flies when you're having fun. Okay, Lynn says, what led you to have Roya lose a child? That took me by surprise. Um, spoiler alert, big time. But yeah, I was writing that scene 
and I didn't plan on that occurring. But once it did and it happened on the page, I went back and I looked at everything leading up to it and I realized subconsciously it made sense and maybe my subconscious was trying to tell me that so I kept it. And those who finished the book know that that's a huge sort of echo throughout the book. Excellent. All right. One last question. Eileen, I, Eileen says, uh, do you have an agent who promoted your book? Yes, I have an agent. The agent doesn't necessarily promote your book. The agent sells your book. So once you get an agent, the agent sells your book to the publishing houses, to an editor at a publishing house. So I have a wonderful agent and she's been my agent since the very beginning, since before Together Tea came out. And was there a process to find an agent? Absolutely. There's a very uh, sort of well-oiled process. Publishing, like every industry, once you know how it works, it's a lot easier. Once you finish your manuscript for a novel, you then query agents. So you send out query letters to agents that you think would represent your book or represent books like your book that you admire. And then if you get an agent, then the agent takes your manuscript. Often they'll have their own notes and then they submit it to the publishers. If you wanna publish with the big five in the US, you really can't do it without an agent. It's incredibly difficult. You need an agent. Thank you so much. Well, Marjan, our time has come to an end here. It did fly by. Thank you, Tina. Flew by. We thank you so much. And we thank everyone here for tuning into this month's Beyond the Page book club. And a special thanks again, Marjan Kamali. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Tina. This was a lot of fun and I could have talked to you all night. So thank you for, for hosting me and thank you everybody for the great questions. Absolutely. Take care. All right, join us over the coming weeks as we take a dive into our April selection. We're gonna be reading The Burning Girls by C.J. Tudor. The virtual conversation will take place on Saturday, April 25th at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to also join our Beyond the Page Facebook group for even more discussion topics as you read the novel. And now we're going to go to another quick message from Sandy on how you can show your support. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Tina. Hi, everyone again. And thank you so much, Marjan. Thank you to everyone at home for joining us this evening. And a special shout out to GBH members in our virtual audience. All donations from viewers, listeners, and event attendees help keep us going. And as mentioned earlier, we have a special offer for our attendees tonight. If you are able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer, or $60 all at once, you can choose a thank you gift of either the hard copy of April's Beyond the Page Pick, The Burning Girls by CJ Tudor, and get a head start on that, or select this beautiful autographed copy of Together Tea, Marjan's first novel, and visit gbh.org slash support events and si or simply text GBH to 800-492-1111 to make that donation. Help bring more stories to light on TV, radio, digital, and to virtual platforms. Go to gbh.org slash support events to make a donation all at once or $5 a month and or click the link you see in the chat tab right now to be brought to our secure site. And thank you for being here for your incredible support and happy reading everyone. Back to you, Tina. Thanks, Sandy. We do look forward to connecting with you again. And we hope that you and your family are staying healthy, and both emotionally and physically during this time. Take care. Have a great night.